to be here, share with you from the Word of God. I'd like you to turn with me, please, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 17. That's where I'm going back in our study of the book of Acts. And he's going to read five verses from verse 10 down to verse 15. And I want to consider this morning the noble Bereans. The noble Bereans. And so it says this, beginning in verse 10, it says, The brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. Also, of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also, and stood up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they were con they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. God will bless that reading of his precious word of this, this morning. One of the things that stands out to us right at the beginning of this little section is the persistence, we might even say the dogged determination of Paul and Silas to preach the gospel despite persecution. Because in the previous place, um, well, they ran into some difficulties in Thessalonica. They'd gone to the synagogue there, and we notice in verse 5 it says, but, uh, but the Jews who believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the base assault, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So their previous experience was that the Jews were envious of the, the success of Paul and Silas, and they, they went to get rent them all and caused a riot in town and attacked the place where the Christians were meeting. And this is a bit of a pattern. In fact, when we when when they get thrown out of the rear at the end of this section, this will be the fifth time in the book of Acts, that they'd be kicked out of somewhere. And yet, you'd think they kind of wise up and say, well, this is not a good plan. Everywhere we go, we get a riot. But everywhere they went, they got converts. They got blessing. They saw things happen. And so it, it is just interesting that um, despite the persecution, almost the certainty of it, they still kept at it. And you got to ask yourself, what is driving this man? Like, well, what kind of a man is this that knowing full well, if he goes to these Jews, there's going to be trouble, and yet he keeps on going? Well, let me tell you something about this man. Look at 1 Corinthians, just for a second, chapter 9 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16. We get to know a little bit about this man. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16, he says this about himself. He says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glorify of or boasting in, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Wow, that's a determined individual, isn't it? I mean, this is, God has put this burden upon me, and woe is me if I don't do it. I am going to do it no matter what. That's pretty determined. He reminds me a little bit of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. I want to go back to Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah also received a lot of opposition and persecution, and was thrown into a pit, uh, had all kinds of things, he was arrested. Uh, some of his writings were cut up with a penknife, actually, with God's word. 
I mean, just a lot of opposition, but in, in chapter 20 of Jeremiah, verse 9, it says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him. In other words, it gets to the point where he says, Okay, I'm not going to say it anymore. Like, it's too much trouble. I'm just going to stay quiet. And then he said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. In other words, I'm done. This is just too much. Then he says, But his word was in my heart as a burning fire should open my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not say. Because he said, I had such a burning in me that I had to proclaim God's message. That's like Paul, just burning with this message. This gospel has done so much for him, he can't stay quiet. I've got to do it no matter what the opposition. And of course, Paul had a great burden for his kinsmen, according to the flesh, the Jews. Book of Romans chapter 10 and verse 1 gives us an inkling of just how much he cared about these people, uh, his kinsmen, according to the flesh, Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, we, we get something that they pronounce our cry here. Romans 10 and verse 1 says this, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for you is that they might be saved. And so he goes to the synagogue again, despite the past experience. Yeah, reminds me of the, my friend Dale and Edmund. Talked about it the other night. Ten years preaching on the streets. In all weather, uh, snow, 30 below zero, terrible winds. Edmonton, you know anything about that? It's the Canadian pet prairies. The wind's blowing all the time. Freezing cold, and yet he's out there, all weathers, persecution, all the rest of it. And But yet, God has put that burden in his heart, and he can't stay still. He's got it to speak. And of course, when you think about people like this, you know, it's kind of pretty convicting, isn't it? How lacking in zeal for the gospel you and I can be. How easily put off we are. We talk to somebody and maybe we get a, a, a kind of door closed and we're done. We're kind of we're going home and we're going to soak for a week. They didn't listen. <laughs> These guys had riots and yet they still have not Is that amazing? What a challenge to us. What a help us to be more like the servants of God who has such determination. I've told the story before about John Wesley, one of my heroes, but it seemed like everywhere he went, there was a mob waiting for him. Uh, they threw dead cats, they threw uh, rotten cabbages, tomatoes, rocks, anything at him. But everywhere he went, people got saved. He preached the gospel. Souls were saved. <laughs> and it was a time, and I've told you this before, but I find it amazing, a time when nobody, there was no mob meeting him anymore, and wondered if he was out of the will of God. How come nobody saw, you know, those that live godly in Christ Jesus will, shall suffer persecution. Nobody's persecuted. They say, there's something wrong with me. It's a sin in my life, God. How come nobody's throwing cats at me anymore? And somebody saw him, threw a rock at him, hit him on the head, and he said, thank you, Lord. That's so foreign to us, isn't it? Absolutely foreign. And yet, uh, we see, this is how the work of God is established in the New Testament. In the midst of opposition. That's how the work was built. And so it says in verse 10, the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night to Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews, almost back into the lion's den once again. Now Berea is about 50 miles west of Thessalonica. And again, we just see this, this determination, this one-track mind. We go to the synagogue, uh, there's already an audience there, they've got two-thirds of the message, they just need the rest of the story, and so we, we begin there. We also recognize that there's going to be uh, these God-fearing Gentiles who are sick of paganism, who are already going to be there, there's going to be an audience, so they go where they're going to get a hearing. Notice verse 11, but there's a different response in the synagogue in Berea. And it says, the brethren immediately, um, sorry, verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. He's going to set up a contrast for us. We're going to see that as we compare these two synagogues and the reception to the message, 
it's going to be very different. One group is far more noble than the other group. And uh, so we're going to think about that term noble, by the way. Uh, you often hear, like uh, in England, it would be very common, you'd have somebody called a nobleman, right? And the Bible uses that term, nobleman. What does a noble mean? It's interesting, the word comes from eugenis, a Greek word eugenis, from which we get our word eugenics. Anybody hear the word eugenics before? That's what Hitler used, right? To, you know, the, the superior race, and we want to weed out all the, the riffraff, the inferior species, so we have the master race. So that idea of noble, it's kind of, the idea is high-born, uh, uh, or, or we might say well-born, a well-born well person, high, like we say aristocracy, that kind of idea. Somebody with uh, blue blood running through their veins, kind of a bit of a royalty kind of person. But it's often used, uh, certainly in the world in that way, but, but it's also used in a, in, a, in a very marvelous way in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. I want you just to look at Luke 19 for a moment. Because used in a parable, I do believe that in this instance, the term noble is used as the only real nobleman that ever lived. And it says in chapter 19, verse 12, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants, delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, occupy the wild heart. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to guess who that's talking about. The Lord Jesus goes to a far country, but he's coming back. And that certain noble <laughs> is the only person that ever was high born. <laughs> that's him. He was he was the one who was born from on heart, but he really was the one who had that perfect pure blood running through his veins. But we heard this morning that he wasn't tempted with sin. Part of the reason he was not tempted with sin is not because he was God manifest in the flesh, but because he had no sin nature either. And so even in his humanity, he couldn't be tempted. Uh, he was the perfect man. He's the only noble man in every world. The, the only true noble man. Some of us have, have, have claimed that title. Uh, actually, generally speaking, those that think they're noble man are some of the hardest people to reach. Because they think they're above the need of the gospel. If you look at First Corinthians chapter one again, we see that word used again. First Corinthians chapter one and verse twenty-six. Read these words. It says, "For well, you see your calling, brethren, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble." are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Not many wise men, not many mighty, not many noble. Now, thankfully, God has saved some of the nobility. Now, a, a, a great heroine of mine is a lady called Selina, Countess of Huntington. And uh, she was related to the royal family in England. She lived during the time of the Methodist revival. And she was gloriously saved. And she said that she was so thankful for the letter M because it says not many nobles are born. That it doesn't say not any noble at all. Mm -hmm. And she was gloriously saved. And she, uh, uh, with her wealth, bankroll, bankrolled the Methodist revival. There were so many people getting saved, so many need for new buildings, that she was the one who financed a lot of the building program of the Methodist revival. And so I'm, I'm glad for her sake that it, it didn't say not any more. And so sometimes there are people who are uh, maybe aristocratic that come to Christ. In fact, if you look at the history of the early brethren movement, most of the people who were saved in those early days were nobles. They were lords, uh, Lord Congleton, uh, just a whole bunch of them. They were all kind of connected with the upper classes, the, the nobility, the intelligentsia. Uh, and that was a kind of amazing work of God in those days. But the next generation, 
they were just ordinary people. And in the 1859 revival, that's when the common people heard the word and received it with gladness. Thank God for that. Uh, that uh, but, but again, just this idea of noble, uh, it, it says these were more noble. And, and, and maybe the thought is here uh, that these um, were a higher class, better bred, more courteous than the people in less than life. And at least they were willing, out of courtesy, to give a hearing to the word of God. And so it says they were more noble, more fair-minded, perhaps the idea is, unprejudiced, impartial, than those in that sister. So how is that evidence? How is it evidence that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica? Well, it tells us exactly how. It says they received the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily whether these things were so. So it was evidenced by the fact that they were willing to receive the word that Paul brought to them. Okay, so they 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 they, they gave him a proper hearing and they they received what he had to say, but they didn't just gullibly accept it. They actually searched the scriptures to check it out to make sure that what he was saying was correct. I think that's really important. They didn't just swallow the message, hook, line, and sinker, but they investigated what Paul had said, carefully weighed the evidence from the scripture. And of course, the scripture is concerned with it being the Old Testament. Paul, when he went to the synagogues, he preached Christ to them. From the Old Testament, he, he followed the Lord Jesus' methodology on that road to Emmaus, that where he, he, he says, uh, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, where uh, he spoke the things concerning himself. So he took that kind of methodology, Paul, and he used the Old Testament scriptures to teach that Jesus of Nazareth was the only possible one who could fulfill all of these messianic prophecies. And so as he did that, they checked it out. They searched the scriptures. Is this really so? And they, uh, they they gave it proper investigation. They were willing to consider the evidence. And really, uh, you can't come to Christ unless you're willing to consider the evidence. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and you have to consider the evidence. And that's what they were willing to do. And we're thankful for the Bereans. Uh, they had a teachable attitude, and, and they wanted to just, they didn't just accept things. They were willing to test it by the sacred scriptures and make sure it was so. Now, I'm saying all this to say this. I don't think there's ever been a day where we as Christians need to be Bereans more than today. And the reason I say that is many evangelical Christians are very gullible. They'll swallow anything. And they are doing the latest patchy trend, whatever it might be, people are just believing it without actually searching the scriptures first to see if it really is so. And we want to encourage here in this assembly for you to be a Berean. Don't just accept it because Shannon Bollinger says it, or Ross Ragland, or Mike Atwood, or Justin. You check it out. You 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 hold us accountable. Come come up to us that and say, "Sorry, man, that's not right." We, we want to be held accountable. We want you to be Bereans, every one of you, mm -hmm. to study and make sure these things are so. And we don't want you just to swallow everything without properly checking it out, because that's what's happening. In a lot of evangelicalism today, I get a paper called the Berean Call, and it's it's a, it's a it's a call for us to be Bereans, and, and it talks about some of the current trends that are going on in the church today, and how people are swallowing this completely. Yeah. Things like social justice is part of the gospel. Is it? It's not part of the gospel. Search it out. Now the gospel will transform culture and will bring justice. But it's the gospel that does it. And we could go on. I, I don't want to get sidetracked and all that stuff. And stuff. I just want to see how important it is. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. This should be our test of everything 
that is brought before us. Isaiah 8 20, great, great scripture, good to, to have this in our minds. It says, To the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In other words, everything we hear, we have to take it to the law and the testimony. And if it doesn't line up, there's no light in them. No matter how eloquent they may be, no matter how clever their arguments are, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, it is to be utterly rejected. So notice uh, the, the response here, as a result of having listened to the word of God, given proper attention to it, and then checking it out, searching it out, doing proper diligence, considering the evidence. Notice okay. what happens in verse 12. It says, therefore, many of them believe. Isn't that wonderful? You see, it's, it's, not, it's not that what we're saying, not what, what Paul was preaching it, it is, is wrong. It exactly lines up with Scripture. We can be confident in the message we're preaching. And so when they did search it out, they came to the conclusion, this is the truth. And they believed it. Praise God for that. But there was a response amongst the Christians in, or amongst the Jews in Thessalonica. And they believed the word of God. And they were saved. And it's a wonderful thing. The Jews of Thessalonica uh, didn't do that, but those in Berea did. And so it says, therefore, many of them believed. Also, honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, uh, not a few. And of course, this would be the Gentiles that were there. Now, what I want to do is just do a little comparison. And I think this is what Loki is doing. He's laying two things down side by side. The response in Thessalonica amongst the Jews, the response in Berea amongst the Jews. And so we're just going to do that because we're going to compare verse 4 um, and uh, the verse we just read here uh, in verse 12. So we're just going to like verse 4 and verse 12 side by side. So notice uh, verse um, Verse 4 in Thessalonica, it says, and some of them believe. Verse 12, therefore, many of them believe. Okay? Some, many. Big difference, right? And, and of course, this is the Jews. Why? Because they gave it a fair hearing. Uh, they, they were more fair-minded. They, they listened to what Paul had to say. The result was many of them believe. The Bereans, much more response amongst the Jews than the Jews. Now when we come to the uh, the other groups, it, it's the same the same response basically. Uh, the the noble women uh, are about the same, uh, the, the God fearers are about the same, the differences amongst the Jews. And so the main point of contrast is with these two groups of Jews, Paul commended the, the them in in Berea and he did not in Thessalonica. He did because they were not noble like that. Now here's the point. Both Jewish groups had the same word preached to them by the same speaker about the same Messiah. So everything in terms of the seed and the sower is identical in both cases. And yet the response is hugely different. Some believe, many believe. And what's the difference? What is it that prevents people from responding? And the key thought that he's bringing out is really prejudice. The Jews in Thessalonica had a bias against the word of God. They weren't willing to listen to it. They weren't willing to give it a proper hearing. Uh, they uh, they had a, an opinion against something without adequate basis. They weren't even willing to consider the evidence. They just got this prejudice against the word of God as a whole that he was preaching to them. And so they basically, their minds were closed. I want to just talk about, because I think this is, what, this is what determines how we will respond to the word of God. If we have a prejudice, both as Christians and non-Christians. <laughs> A bias against scripture will affect your ability to hear. So I'll give you an example. Um, I, I went to speak in an assembly, and I was asked to speak on the role of women and head coverage. That was my topic. Now, again, I, I didn't ask to speak on it. I was asked to speak on it. So I show up at this assembly, and a lady meets me outside of the door. These were her first words to me. 
I don't care what you say, I will not wear it. Hmm. Now, do you think she had a prejudice against what was going to be said? Is she willing to search the scriptures and see if they're so? She's already made her mind up. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made my mind up, see? And so there are a lot of people like that. Christians, they truly save people, but there are certain things in the word of God they have already got a prejudice against. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, okay, what do you say? I'm not going to do that. And, and it was tragic. So that day I preached on John 7, 17. Uh, I think this was my, I just want to read this text. It was very, really cool. Understand this. I'm convinced that the will is the key to the intellect. John 7, 17 says, if any man will do his will, was if there's this willingness to do God's will, he says, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. And that's the key. That if you really want to grow in your understanding of the word of God, it starts with a willing heart. Not with a brilliant mind. It's not how clever you are, how smart you are. It's how willing you are to do God's will. If you come to the scriptures and say, Lord, whatever your word says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to obey it. You think you'll grow? You think the Lord will minister to a heart like that? I think you should grow in leaps and bounds. If you come to the word of God and say, well, Lord, uh, I want you to speak to me, but don't speak to me about this area because I've already decided where I'm going at this point. And don't speak to me about this thing because this, this might not want anybody bothering me with that. Right? You can't help a person like that. The will is the key to the intellect. It really is. Are you willing? So that's an example of Christians. Just that's one of many I could give you where people have already got a prejudice against the word of God, and it doesn't matter what you say, they're not going to change. What about non Christians? They're not well, believers to have a prejudice against the word of God in the Bible. Could be they've had a bad experience in the church at some point. Could be that. Um, Maybe even Christians have offended them or hurt them in the past. Maybe they've just listened to the lies taught in colleges and they've already got a prejudice against the word themselves. No matter what you say, I'm not going to listen. And so it's very hard to reach people who have a predisposed prejudice. We found them, um, well, growing up in our uh, religious system, uh, we were taught to have a bias against the Bible. People told us, uh, and, and, and our relatives, if you read the Bible, they go blind or insane. We were told that. No, so immediately you've got, got this kind of barrier up, right? You, you've got a prejudice. What a tragedy. And, and uh, there are many that are prejudiced against the word of God. Maybe you have a moral issue. But in a life of sin. And I don't want to hear what the Bible says. Hear people, George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright, couldn't stand the Bible in his house. Because it condemns us, right? It convicts us if we're living a, a, a wicked life. We don't want the Bible around. And so sometimes people, uh, I've said this before, Josh McDowell, he, uh, he used to do a lot of debates on university campuses. And it comes to question, any kind of question about apologetics. And often you find one individual who kept coming back with objections. He said, well, what about this? And he'd answer that. And then he said, well, what about this? And eventually, Josh McDowell would say to him, sir, can I ask you a question? What? You have a moral problem. Is there some sin in your life you don't want to deal with? And invariably, the bias against the word of God is because it's going to crack my star. If I accept what this Bible says, I can't live like the further I am anymore. So, so, so prejudice holds people back. For the Jews of Thessalonica, their unwillingness to give a proper hearing to the word of God would determine their eternal destiny. See, you reject the only Savior. What happens? You're forever lost. 
serious consequence about having a prejudice against the word of God. It's the only message that contains the truth about a savior who can save rebels and sinners from the lake of fire. It's the only message that has that. Every other message says save yourself. And you can't because you're lost. And so it would have consequences to them. What about believers? What about believers that refuse to deal with scripture honestly? Well, I think it's going to affect your rewards and your future service in the coming year. It really is. all the implications for refusing truth. And so the Jews in Thessalonica resisted the word, the Jews in Berea received the word. And God, the question is, what about you? Are you somebody who is going to receive the word? Now again, I didn't say this, receiving it after doing due diligence. Searching the scriptures, seeing if it's so. Don't just believe it that somebody says it. But we want Bereans, but we also want people who are willing, most considering the evidence, to say it. Because that's what the scripture says. That's what we want. Now, can you imagine what it must have been like in Berea? Paul's speaking in the synagogue, and these guys are searching the scriptures, and I suspect there are all kinds of Bible studies, men and women poring over, comparing scripture with scripture, see if Jesus, who Paul preached, really was indeed the Christ. And you could just imagine the excitement. Oh, yeah, he clearly is. And like the genealogy fits, and this fits, and, and, and pretty soon they're, they're believing the message. Wow, that must have been exciting. By the way, it's a wonderful thing when you see eagerness for the Word of God. Search it out. Uh, we, we just came back from this three day thing. Uh, the men's the intensive Bible study, and as we were saying goodbye yesterday, it was really interesting. There were, I spoke to three different groups of guys who all had a six hour drive home after the conference six hours to Oklahoma, six hours to southeast Missouri, six hours central Iowa, four guys, Nebraska. And they, they took two days off work, drove six hours each way. To sit for 20 hours considering the scriptures. I think that was an exciting few days. It was delightful. Praise God for that. I had a friend with me. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he's a former neighbor. I know him really well. And he, he, he went along and said, Mike, he said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Mm -hmm. That's exciting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's good to be a Berean, to be eager to, to consider the scriptures. But notice verse 13. It says, But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul in the real, somehow the message got out you know, on the great line, and it came to their attention that Paul was now doing the same thing in Berea, and he's done in Thessalonica. What do they do? It says, They came thither also and stirred up the people. Imagine that. 50 mile trip. Now, not driving here, this is walking, not easy terrain, a 50 mile journey to shut down the gospel. Isn't it amazing the lengths the enemies of God will go to frustrate the work of God? And yet, the question is how far are we willing to travel to support the gospel? They're, they're willing to travel 50 miles on foot to stop the gospel. Are we willing to go across the street to spread the gospel? You see what I'm saying here? They're willing to do, I, I used to love when we were in Ireland, they used to, used to do a lot of gospel meetings. And people would really support those meetings. <laughs> people would go night after night for weeks on end. Is that inconvenient? Like people have got lives outside of the gospel means every night of the week, but they still would support these things. They would come, they would bring their families, they would bring their neighbors, and they were all in in support of the gospel. Isn't that amazing. There was one guy, I was talking to a guy up in Canada, and he, he was privileged to be part of a gospel campaign in Colorado, in Northern Ireland, that went on for 50 weeks. 
Isn't that amazing? Wow. You know, all but 50 people got saved. They kept saying, well, whatever God's saving souls, we'll keep going. Every week somebody got saved. 50 souls saved. That's all the that's in this building right now. Like it's a whole new congregation. Is that worth 50 weeks? It's not for us to even get out midweek, never mind. Do 50 weeks. Right? This is a this is a different mindset. And so here's these enemies of the gospel making a 50-mile journey when transportation is not easy. Try and stop the gospel. By the way, isn't it tragic? It's one thing to not want the gospel yourself. That's very serious. But to actually try and stop others hearing the gospel. That is incredibly serious. You know, the Lord Jesus said this. He that is not with me, he is against me. Talk about opposition to Christ. And ultimately, those people paid a huge price for their opposition. So it says in verse 14, it says, And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus had moved there still. So, so was it wasn't any results. Now it's interesting. We you know we read about the special Thessalonican assembly, the first and second Thessalonians were letters that were written to them, but we don't really know about what really happened in Berea. Was there any results? Well, we know there was some. I'll give you two reasons why there were some results there that were worth considering. Chapter twenty of Acts and verse four says there accompanied him into Asia. Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derby and Timotheus of Anavasia, Tychicus and Tropimus. So at least one convert kind of became a disciple of Paul and traveled with him in evangelistic labors into Asia. This guy Sopater of Berea. So well, at least you got one, not only a convert, but somebody who's into this big time. He's actually traveling with Paul and serving with him. That's amazing. But the very fact that they left behind Timothy and Silas is because there was a reason why they stayed behind. You have new converts who need to be taught. Paul's always considered to be the lightning rod. So we move the lightning rod out of the town, but the other guys stay there. They ministered to those converts. So God did a great work there in Berea. Then notice um, again the believers how how much they must have thought about Paul because it says um, verse fifteen it says and they conducted Paul brought him to Athens now I mean, I didn't look it up on how what a distance it is from Berea to Athens but I suspect it's considerable distance but they so appreciated this man's labors they went with him. As far as Athens on his journey. Isn't that encouraging? So, as we kind of bring our thoughts to a conclusion, I want to ask you because I don't want to just assume that everybody here um, is really a Berean and has studied the scriptures to see if these things are so. I've got a booklet, I just picked them up actually, and this is from Randy McWilson in Jackson put this together based on a sermon Jay Nicholson did called uh, The Uniqueness of Christianity. And it's a beautiful book. And it's this, Consider the Evidence. I see have a friend, uh, Matthew Burney, a young fellow. Uh, he's going to be saved maybe a couple of years. I don't know. Just a, I've never met a young man like him. So zealous. So he, Matthew, uh, he goes on campus symbol. And I was always thinking, I said, would you consider yourself to be an open minded person? Everybody said, I'm very open minded. But he said, Well, I open to consider the evidence. What do you mean? Gives him this one. Because they've already said they're open minded, so they got committed. He gives them this book. And I want to offer to anybody I've got a few here, if anybody who's not saved, Never accepted Christ as your Savior. If you want to consider the evidence more, you're willing to be like those Jews and believers. I'd like to give this to you after the message. Come back. Glad to give it to you, but I want you to consider the evidence. 
because the evidence that Jesus is indeed the only Savior and the only Messiah is absolutely true. And it, 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 um, it allows for scrutiny. We encourage scrutiny because what we believe is not some unprovable thing. We believe that there's sound evidence for the fact that Jesus was born as God manifesting in heaven, that he lived a perfect life, that he died as a substitute for sinners on Calvary's cross. And that he says, whoever would call on his name would be saved. We believe that evidence is so clear to the word of God. And we, we'd like you to be sure that you were sure you were saved. Because it would be a terrible thing if you heard someday and even thought you were a Christian and you stand before the Lord Jesus and you can say this, Apart from me, I never knew you. That would be a bad And maybe it would be because you just didn't do due diligence and consider the evidence. We touched it too. We thought that if you might say, get some evidence that I think is very clear and search it out. Don't just don't just swallow it to be a Berea. Saved and unsaved. Everybody in this room, be a Berea. Search the See the soul. We have nothing to be ashamed of or to hide. It's all clear. The word of God supports what we preach. We want you to see it. So check it out. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful uh, for the word of God that it is verifiable that these things didn't happen in a corner, that they're well documented even by secular history. Oh, we have so much evidence. We're thankful for it. And yet, Lord, we're mindful that sometimes we can have biases that hold us back from truly receiving the message that you would have us to, to believe. And we pray, even as believers, Lord, if there's, if there's biases in our minds that hold us back from fully responding, Lord, reveal those things that we might repent of them and we have a Berean heart, willing to search it out, willing to obey it, willing, knowing that if we're willing to do your will, we will know the doctrine of God. We'd be praising God. Thank you.